So thank you all very much. Um, I will be brief, but I also want to add my uh, voice of thanks to all of the org organizers of uh, the last uh, uh, day today and tomorrow. This is really just a splendid um, uh, series of events. And the word fun um, doesn't often get used in the context of academic symposia, but fun is really a, an appropriate word to use. These have been just such delightful presentations that I'm looking forward to the ones that are upcoming. Um, just a note of personal privilege, um, 100 years ago, Lookout Mountain, uh, Buffalo Bill, um, a massive funeral. Uh, my grandfather and grandmother were there, uh, along with my mother, age two. So somehow, these things come around in all sorts of strange ways. Um, let me introduce um, our first panelist. Uh, Frank Christensen, uh, I think most of you know Frank, you know his work. He's an associate professor of English um, and an associate dean, God bless him, an associate dean of the College of Humanities at, uh, at BYU. He's also the editor of a forthcoming book the Popular Frontier, Buffalo Bill's Wild West and Transnational Mass Culture. And his talk is entitled, The Special Relationship as Popular Culture, 1889 to 1906. Please join me in welcoming Frank. Uh, thanks, Bob. Um, I just want to echo like everybody else, uh, how gratifying and stimulating this uh, symposium has been uh, to this point. Um, I was going over my notes, um, and I could spend half this talk just uh, making callbacks to yesterday's sessions. There were uh, so many things that um, I found helpful in my own thinking. Uh, but I do have a couple prefatory thoughts before I get into my formal remarks. Um, from some things that uh, Patty Limerick said in her keynote yesterday. Uh, first, I really like her idea of um, Buffalo Bill, what she called Buffalo Bill Studies, as um, field notes. Um, that, that pun on, on field that identifies our uh, collective project as um, inherently ecumenical um, in its approach to scholarship, one that is called forth uh, by the very nature of the subject. Uh, and her informal survey was, a, uh, I thought, a very um, helpful, enlightening exercise as she asked about the various backgrounds of, of those in the audience. I like to think that um, the papers is uh, working toward this vision in a, in a variety of ways. Um, one of which is uh, the uh, William F. Cody's series on the history and culture of the American West. Uh, just a quick uh, review of the 2017 uh, publications that are out and forthcoming. Um, suggests the variety of uh, institutional affiliations we have. Um, Steve Friesen's book, uh, uh, he's of course uh, curator of a museum. Uh, we have uh, Julia Bricklin's and uh, the forthcoming Joe Debro book. Um, they both uh, enjoy uh, various uh, measures of independence as, as scholars. Um, and then The Popular Frontier, the, uh, the essay collection I edited is a more conventional um, uh, work of essays by um, scholars at, at uh, universities. So we, we think this is um, the kind of cross-section of the kind of scholarship we can uh, expect going forward. And by the way, uh, by way of a pitch, open for business, we're soliciting manuscripts and really interested in uh, your ongoing work and work you know of from others that you might uh, send our way. Uh, that The series also highlights, uh, I think, a unique feature of the papers that was foregrounded for us uh, recently at an Association for Documentary Editing conference. This is one of those conferences that uh, Jeremy and and uh, Doug and I traveled together to, although we didn't share the same room. So it was, uh, um, we learned. Yeah. <laughs> uh, th this gathering of editors of documentary um, papers projects, think uh, the Lincoln Papers, Jefferson Papers, Papers of the Ratification of the Constitution, um, it's, uh, many of which are older and more venerable than ours. Um, as uh, Jeremy has suggested elsewhere, they, they were uh, looked to us as innovative in a variety of ways, but. Um, 
one, one way that really struck me was um, the, uh, I, I see the kind of conventional approach to papers projects as kind of toiling to provide um, a documentary record in the hopes that uh, somebody will come and use it. And uh, I think we've taken a much more active approach to fostering scholarship, to maintaining an uh, immediate and symbiotic relationship between uh, editing and scholarly work. Uh, and we, um, we think that makes a real difference. Uh, it animates both in important ways. Second uh, thing that uh, Patty brought up uh, the concept of Cody as a case study, or Buffalo Bill as a case study. Uh, that, that's been a governing principle for the papers um, as we've developed platforms for the documentary editing and the scholarship, including um, uh, the original proposal for the Oklahoma series that we've very much framed it in those terms. Uh, the NEH grants that we've been able to successfully get over the last five or six years. Um, it's also the underlying logic of the CodyArchive.org and CodyStudies.org. And we, in turn, have taken our sort of methodological inspiration from work uh, by Louis Warren and Bob Rydell and others. Um, they demonstrate how readily uh, the Buffalo Bill phenomenon can speak to broader uh, issues. And uh, I think the uh, roundtable session on uh, the legacy of Buffalo Bill's America tomorrow will, will demonstrate that in interesting ways. Uh, one third uh, kind of set up for this. I recently attended a Transatlantic Studies Association conference in which uh, a reconsideration of the so-called <laughs> special relationship was uh, a central focus. That's, that's the special relationship, the rhetorical formulation that Winston Churchill articulated in his uh, 1946 Sinews of Peace speech at uh, Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. What Churchill called the Fraternal Association of English-Speaking Peoples uh, this was not a new framework, it was a, a uh, reiteration of a long-standing uh, formulation in the face of new political circumstances. In this case, it was the rhetorical kickoff to the Cold War. Once again, that relationship is under scrutiny as the rise of populist nationalism is reshaping geopolitics in the 21st century. Both moments now, 1946, recall uh, f for us, I think, an earlier moment of high nationalism that found one of its most potent expressions uh, in a transnational context, the, the period of the Wild West in Europe. So the rest of my remarks will represent uh, parts of uh, my effort to frame the, uh, the work that went into the, uh, the popular frontier, which is uh, forthcoming with the University of Oklahoma in uh, December. Uh, the book includes essays from a wide range of scholars and disciplines, including history, art history, literary studies, but um, there are a disproportionate number of chapters that deal with the Wild West in Britain, and um, part of this is about trying to account for that. So one premise of the book is that Europe is central to the legacy of Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Any study of the Wild West exhibition in Europe is also, at least implicitly, an account of how the Wild West uh, became America's national entertainment and how this promotional claim, its meaning shifting based on when and where, Thanks, John. its meaning shifting based on when and where it appeared found a believing public on two continents between 1887 and 1906. Focusing more specifically on the British Wild West, if you look today, you'll find uh, still uh, many traces or signs of uh, the Wild West exhibition's passage through Britain across multiple tours. Uh, they included a show program in the Victorian wing of the Museum of London, um, a burial marker in Brompton Cemetery for Long Wolf, uh, Lakota Sioux performer who died of pneumonia in 1892, uh, street signs in Salford, uh, Manchester, with names such as Buffalo Court, Cody Court, and Kansas Avenue, indicating where the exhibition uh, was encamped uh, and performed during the uh, winter of 87, 88. Uh, there's a bronze Buffalo, Buffalo Bill statue in East uh, Glasgow, a saddle displayed in the, the castle at St. Michael's Mount 
uh, which Cody gave to the Baron St. Levan in 1904 during the Wild West Farewell Tour. Uh, these are just some pieces of uh, public memory preserved and displayed in locations prominent and obscure. They in turn are supplemented by thousands of items, newspapers, periodicals, dime novels, postcards, illustrations, art, sheet music, and photographs stowed in various archives across the country, including the British Library. Physical evidence of uh, the Wild West European history is more apparent in Britain than any other parts of Europe. The exhibition began its first and final European tours in England, where it spent more time than in any other country outside the United States. The British experience of the Wild West has a prominent place in the exhibition's international history, in part because uh, England played a determining role in the broader history of American cultural exports. Because of its relative linguistic and cultural affinity with the United States, England was the, the natural port of entry for the Wild West and functioned as a, a proof of concept for Cody and his partners. Um, emboldened by their success after nearly a year in England, the exhibition organizers returned to the United States to regroup and prepare uh, for more extensive continental runs. Uh, those cultural affinities were underwritten, though, by important uh, structural developments. In his study of post-World War II Americanization in Britain, H.L. Macho argues that Quote, viewing the special relationship as popular culture offers a rich means of exploring how culture moves across national boundaries and shaping both public policy and private subjectivity. The essays in uh, Popular Frontier um, illustrate the value of this proposition in an earlier moment. Malco focuses on post-World War II. Um, even as they broaden the inquiry beyond the Anglo-American framework, in 87, Cody and his team saw an opportunity through the spectacle of the Wild West exhibition to reimagine the relationship between the United States and Britain, an opportunity that was at the same time a business venture, of course, with its commercial potential bound up with um, these same political and cultural subtexts. A half century before the Cold War uh, began, many of the conditions which Malko uh, bases his study uh, were already emerging. And indeed, his characterization of the post-war context that, quote, made American culture and its agents central to any narrative of Britain uh, could aptly describe the environment that ushered in or ushered the Wild West East to Europe. These include a vast increase in contact that transmuted uh, American culture via tourist and professional cross traffic, what he describes as an unparalleled growth in the de density of transatlantic media. The quantitative and qualitative transformation of media culture in particular as Joel Wiener has shown, it was a hallmark of the Victorian and Edwardian era. And this is another unifying thread across the, the collection of essays in this book. So th the point is that the, the revolution uh, Malko describes requires a transatlantic frame because it was in significant measure a product of the interaction between American and British institutions responding to the possibilities of mass circulation. And all of this is kind of uh, reinforcing um, Joe DeRoe's point about the centrality of, of, of the newspaper. In his account of the rise of newspaper culture in Britain and the United States, uh, Joel Wiener points out that both the terms Americanization and transatlantic entered popular parlance at approximately the same time in the 1870s and 80s. In fact, the first substance of use of Americanization in the British press appeared in the very year the Wild West exhibition first arrived in, in Britain. Wiener's study demonstrates that primary, the primary medium for the dissemination of these related concepts was, in fact, the newspaper. The rise of cheap print is an important context for most of the essays in this book, and as the primary platform for mass circulation, cheap print was central to the Wild West success by serving as an extension of the e exhibition's own marketing innovations. The history of the Wild West European tours has been understood within a broader thesis on the changing state of late 19th century American nationalism. One common narrative describes it as the first wave of Americanization in Europe, the preface to the American century, and as a key chapter in the related account of an emergent gla uh, global mass culture. Newspaperman uh, William Stead, British, uh, in 1902 uh, published Americanization of the World. It was subtitled The Trend of the 20th Century and offered a portrait of American political and commercial systems that were quite literally irresistible. 
Stead uh, concludes his study by presenting his fellow Britons uh, with uh, what he calls a momentous choice between merging with the United States to become a, a quote, integral part of the greatest of all world powers, or uh, accepting, quote, ultimate status as an English-speaking Belgium. <laughs> Citing prominent voices such as Teddy Roosevelt, Andrew Carnegie, Walter Besant, Stead goes on to imagine a reunion of sorts uh, with the United States at the center of an Anglophone empire. This federation of English-speaking peoples would not be without its drawbacks for the British, Stead admits, and his treatise ends on a note of ambivalence as he contemplates a certain future with uncertain consequences. Drawing on the moralist writings of figures such as William Gladstone and William Wordsworth, he cautions against the enervating influence of an American consumerism that, quote, lays waste our powers and leaves none for the cultivation of the higher soul. A century later, Bob uh, Rydell and Rob Crowes subtitled their own study of US popular cultural exports uh, with a nod to the British journalist. Buffalo Bill and Bologna, the Americanization of the world, invokes Stead with a measure of irony, given the highly varied ways the process of Americanization played out in the early 20th century. Rydell and Crowes differentiate among a range of cultural, social, and economic trends, offering a nuanced portrait showing how European uses of the term reject the, quote, one-to-one -one relation between the ideological program of American culture as Americans willfully project it abroad and the ideological reading given to it in the receiving, uh, at the receiving end. Uh, collectively, uh, the essays in this volume break new ground in accounting for the expansive influence of the Wild West exhibition as a transnational phenomenon, while also showing how the exporting of uh, Cody's enterprise contributed to the ongoing project of American national uh, self-definition, Americanization of a, another sort. Buffalo Bill's Wild West in Europe took place alongside other spectacles of cultural nationalism, uh, such as Queen Victoria's 87 Jubilee, uh, celebrations, and the 1889 Exhibition Universelle in Paris. The coincidence of these uh, mass-consumed performances of nationhood and their, at times, literal convergence affords a unique opportunity for exploring how late 19th century conceptions of national affiliation emerged through engagement with a transatlantic imaginary. On the one hand, the history of Buffalo Bill's Wild West is the history of how the frontier went global. Um, as one feature of a broader phenomenon of American or European Americanization. On the other hand, the Wild West's foreign tour suggests that Buffalo Bill's brand of frontierism was to some extent actually a product of globalization. For many Europeans, the story that they witnessed on the Wild West showground began or accelerated their own process of naturalization, leading eventually to their resettlement in the United States. For the Wild West's American audiences, the story of the Wild West's international exploits by 1893, incorporated into the spectacle through the uh, Rough Riders of the World, became integral to the drama of Americanization as it played out domestically. Ultimately, the worldliness of the Wild West advanced the process of national consolidation by bringing the outside in, even as it sold the story of the Wild West to the rest of the world. From the time the exhibition arrived in port, the media coverage of the Wild West London season was uh, insatiable and that coverage was in turn central to how the exhibition represented itself um, across media platforms, including uh, in its own marketing materials. Cody's own account of the first international tour places newspaper stories at the center of his narrative as a way of validating his self-promotional claims and expressing through an ostensibly local voice the political subtext of the performance. And again, Joe has showed us the kind of complications of, of voice with somebody like uh, Burke uh, managing things. The 1888 edition of Cody's autobiography references the new media epoch and its direct attention to the press as well as its own narrative voice. Incorporating the international experience within the larger nationalist project, the centerpiece of Cody's account is a carefully orchestrated staging on showground in the pages of the book of the Wild West's command performance uh, before Queen Victoria, a performance that coincided with the celebration of her jubilee. The Queen's patronage of the Wild West was an integral part of the broader ritual commemoration of her 50-year reign, the Wild West as one of many expressions of Britain's imperial legacy, part of the proliferation of narratives that charted the Anglo-settler explosion of the 18th and 19th centuries. 
the concurrent performances working in mutual interest of national self-definition. Certainly, the British uh, public and press embrace the Wild West in ways that go beyond the sheer entertainment and exoticism of the show. Cody's description of the command performance takes on an overtly patriotic tone uh, in depicting the queen and her nobles bowing before the American flag. Cody uh, uses the scene as the foundation for all his success uh, claims for the Wild West show, both as a business venture and as a cultural emissary. Of course, Cody's account of the event operates under the burden of a larger irony. Uh, just as he has cast the queen in his moment of becoming America's national entertainment, he and his entire enterprise are literally engaged in a command performance for the queen. During the summer of 87, the British press made much of the queen's gradual renewal of her public role as head of state. She had spent the last 25 years in mourning after the death of uh, uh, Prince Albert, and the Wild West was among f the first of her public uh, appearances and it uh, constituted a reassumption of her role as a truly public figurehead. Given this context, the command performance becomes a kind of commentary on the nature of publicity, as one performance is staged within another and the roots of primary interests serve become blurred. The Queen's Own Journal uh, account of the event pays less attention to the political context uh, in favor of the exotic personnel, especially what she calls the Red Indians. Taken in the full context of the cultural reaffirmation of English monarchy, the Wild West becomes one episode in a much larger display of British national pageantry, one that incorporated the American story into a broader history of Anglo-Saxon imperialism embodied in the figure of Victoria herself. A version of this dynamic helps explain why cultural nationalism of the period is hyper-conscious of its European and, in particular, uh, British roots, counterparts, and competitors. In her study of antebellum Anglophone relations, Elisa Tamarkin describes, quote, a more intricate culture of American response that moves beyond a straightforward story of influence, one that exhibits what uh, Tamarkin calls a devotion or Anglophilia that does not, quote, depend on prior ties or ethnic sympathies within Britain, but rather exploits a complex of American attitudes towards history, uh, sociability, and the emotional train of nationalism itself. Tamarkin's conception indicates a much wider engagement in American society with the legacies of British history and culture that would remain uh, an index uh, to a particular experience of being American uh, throughout the 19th century. What Tamarkin sees as devotion, we might uh, uh, broaden to a, form, uh, to a form of attention to another culture that might just as readily evoke feelings of estrangement as affinity, with the result that uh, Anglophilia and Anglophobia um, might simultaneously be expressions of the same nationalist impulse. I'm going to sort of start to wind this up here with this uh, image from Life magazine in 1887. Uh, a sickening blow to the Anglomaniac who finds upon landing in England, so this is the subtext there, who finds upon landing in England that the British nation, thanks to the Honorable Buffalo F. William, has become thoroughly Americanized. <laughs> On one hand, this is another version of the command performance uh, as it would be rendered for an American audience. The central figure in the cartoon is Victoria lassoing a man. Her actions in turn are framed by Wild West figures on one side and more English people aping those performance, uh, performers on the other. But the actual object of satire, the subject of the cartoon, is actually the Anglomaniac, the figure on the right. Uh, we are to understand the scene through the eyes of the horrified American disembarking in full costume uh, to express his Anglophilia and finding his own stereotypes upended. One caricature adds upon another in this satire. National identity is a performance acted and exchanged. The queen has joined in the performance. The American has sought to do the same, but he has no stage to act upon. The autobiography repeatedly represents this ambiguous relationship in its concluding chapters which I am going to skip a discussion of. Um, the essays in this volume have taken the, up the question of how a myth of national exceptionalism translates in a context that is, quote, national in character and yet held beyond the limits of the national territory. This description drawn from the official program of the 1887 American Exhibition in London concisely formulates the nationalist logic of the international Wild West. The work of this study as well as future research will continue to trace out the ways this most 
ephemeral form of culture left its mark upon the people and places of turn of the century Europe and how in turn the national character of the exhibition emerged in relation to the so-called limits it transcended. Thank you.